Hello, I'm Father Kurt Hine. I'm the rector of Light of Christ Anglican Church in Georgetown, Texas. And we are going through to be a Christian, an Anglican catechism, which is a which is a question and answers on the basics of the Christian faith. And it's always good to get back to the basics because we all need to be reminded of um, of really the basics, the foundations of our faith. So today we're going to be going through questions 69 through 72. So this is the part where we're, um, this is part of the catechism where we're going through the creed, the Apostles' Creed, and we're going to be talking about on the third day he rose again and he ascended into heaven. So before we dig into that, uh, please hit the like button and subscribe, and let's pray. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. Okay. So, question 69. We ask, what does the creed mean when it affirms that Jesus rose again from the dead? It means that Jesus was not simply resuscitated. God restored him physically from death to life in his resurrected body, never to die again. His tomb was empty. Jesus had risen bodily from the dead. The risen Jesus was seen by his apostles and hundreds of other witnesses. Okay, so I remember a story of a, I think it was a, yeah, the son of a friend of mine, and his mom was trying to teach him about the resurrection from the dead. It was Easter, and he said, Mom, uh, so so let me get this right. Jesus was a zombie? So I, I think that's, that question is, is really insightful, actually, because what, what he's trying to do is he's trying to frame the resurrection story. He's trying to understand it. And the only thing he can really uh, understand about someone coming back from the dead is that they would be a zombie. So, so there's another thing. Well, Jesus certainly wasn't a zombie. Okay, So he didn't come back sort of dead but able to walk around as zombies do. Um, but neither was he simply resuscitated. So. This is a common mistake, a lot more common than thinking Jesus came back as a zombie, is that he was just simply resuscitated. In other words, you see resuscitations all throughout the Old Testament and New Testament where people um, are dead and then they come back to life. Uh, one of the bigger ones that we see in the New Testament is Jesus resuscitating Lazarus. Um, in fact, actually, someone was resuscitated uh, pretty recently he, uh, Christian Eriksson, he's a player for the, the Denmark national team. He fell over with a heart attack and died, and they medically resuscitated him. So he came back to life. See, the thing is, what makes a resuscitation different from a resurrection is that those that are resuscitated will die. They come back to life, but they have not defeated death. And this is really what makes Jesus' resurrection different, because when Jesus is resurrected, what we are saying is that he defeated death. He was doing more than simply coming back to life. He was transcending death through his body. So the resurrected Jesus has the same body. We know that because, as the catechism says here, his tomb was empty. He has, he has uh, we'll talk about this later, he's got the, the nails in his, in his wrists and his feet. So it's not just a spiritual resurrection. It's a physical one. But it's more than Jesus simply coming back to life. It's him defeating death. And we'll talk more about that later, the, the, the nature of his resurrected body, a body that's actually defeated death. Uh, the Catechism ends this answer by referring to many of the sightings of Jesus after his resurrection. This historical evidence for the resurrection is actually quite strong. Now, I understand that if you believe a priori that miracles can't happen, that a resurrection is impossible, then it really doesn't matter what sort of historical evidence that we're looking at. No matter what sort of historical evidence there may be for the resurrection, if you believe it to be impossible, then it would be rational to simply say, we all, not all the evidence is in. You know, it's something that happened a long time ago. Um, there must be some other explanation, even though we don't have one currently. However, I'd like you to consider a different avenue of thinking. I would like to encourage you to open up your mind to the possibility of resurrection. Imagine, for example, that you were living in 100 AD in Rome, you're a Roman citizen, and somehow someone came back in time. And they 
told you about iPhones and how you could talk to anyone around the world. I mean, however you would understand that, I don't know. Um, they talked about modern cosmology, talk about gravity, talk about space time, uh, everything that uh, Tesla is doing with spaceships, all of this, right? Because you lived in 100 AD, you would think that all of this would be impossible. And you wouldn't really have a way to understand it. Yet, these things are true. So let's think, maybe try to put our feet into that 100 AD person and think about the possibilities that might be open in this world, in this real world, that we may not know of, that perhaps only God knows of. And maybe one of those possibilities would be resurrection. Imagine that perhaps it is possible that someone from the moment of conception could be so in tune with, with that life from which the whole cosmos generated and is sustained, capital L, life, so in tune with that, that even when they died, were murdered actually, they would defeat death itself with that life. Could that be possible? I'll just leave it at that. So if we do uh, open up our minds to the possibility of a resurrection, the historical evidences for the resurrection are actually quite good and they affirm its reality. My favorite little piece of evidence, which I like to talk about, is the evidence of the apostles themselves, the disciples of Jesus, those that followed him. We learned that uh, when Jesus was crucified, they were running for their lives because crucifixion was not all that uncommon and when a political enemy was crucified, guess who came next? Right, the followers. So they were scared, they were hiding, but something happened. Something happened. And these followers, not just one or two, but many, testified to the fact that they saw with their eyes, touched with their hands, this resurrected Christ. And they went to the death saying that this was true. Now, people will die for what they believe is true, but they will not die for what they know is a lie. So they sincerely believe this to be true. And uh, you read their stories, and they're so var varied. They, they meet Christ um, personally, just one-on-one, -on -one, and in groups, in various emotional states, and in, in various places. And they all believe it so there's just like this incredible transformation that happens to them that they're that they're willing to confess to this being the truth even to death i think that's something to really think about um, if you want to learn more about this i'm going to place a link in the comment section below in the information section below to a video i did about about this about i think four years ago now but i i think it still pertains so if you want to learn more about evidences for the resurrection go ahead and click on that let's move here to the next question Okay, question 70. What kind of earthly life did Jesus have after he rose from the dead? Following his resurrection, Jesus spent 40 days visiting and teaching his followers. He appeared to his disciples, spoke to them, invited them to touch him and see his scars, and ate with them. Okay, so as we said before, there's a continuity between Jesus' body, pre-resurrection, and post-resurrection. He had the scars from being nailed to the cross. He had, this, he had the hole in his side from the spear. He spoke to his disciples. They touched him. He ate food with them. He was not a spirit or a ghost. He was physical. He had a physicality to him. Yet, there's also something very different about him. For example, he appears in the middle of locked rooms, suddenly, and then he disappears. He's difficult to recognize, even though you're close to him. And finally, he's able to ascend into heaven. That is. He's able to move freely between the physical and spiritual world without the limitations that we're used to in a human body. Paul, when he talks about the resurrected body, calls this a spiritual body. So a, a truly physical body that is, at the same time, spiritual. Somehow the, the spiritual and the physical are so united in the resurrected Christ that he is able to be... In, in both realities completely. Um, and I think this makes sense of the often confusing yet consistent accounts of the many experiences that people had with Jesus after his resurrection for 40 days, um, showing that something 
something really amazing happened to Jesus. So um, God promises that this same reality will happen to us, that we will be resurrected. And we who are joined to Jesus by faith, um, who follow him, will will also be resurrected by the same spirit that he's given us because of his resurrection. Jesus paved the way for us to experience a more real existence even than the one we have now. So this is the hope of the Christian, not some disembodied heaven away in the skies, but a resurrection, a physical, a physical spiritual body. <laughs> I couldn't find the quote, but I think it's an interesting thought. Um, C.S. Lewis tries to answer the question, how could Jesus walk through walls if he was truly physical? And he makes this comparison. He says, think about um, a solid moving through water, right? A solid is able to move through water because it's, it's more solid than the water. Well, perhaps Jesus was able to walk through walls because he was more solid. He was more real, more substantial than the walls themselves. Interesting thought, I think. Now, let's continue here with the next phrase from the Creed. He ascended into heaven. Question 71. How should you understand Jesus' ascension into heaven? Jesus was taken up out of human sight and returned in his humanity to the glory he had shared with the Father before his incarnation. There he intercedes for and receives into heavenly life all who come to him in faith. Though absent in body, Jesus is always with me by his spirit and hears me when I pray. The ascension is really important, and it's um, a forgotten part of the gospel, but it's an integral part to what Jesus did. Now, we believe that Jesus is God the Son who came uh, into our world. He became human through the Virgin Mary. And so being God, he humbled himself from that glory that he had before he was incarnate. And he, en he humbled himself in order that he could enter a world broken, by sin. Now, the new thing that happens in the ascension is that God the Son, now, since he has a human body as Jesus, ascends into heaven. So, heaven is the spiritual realm where God and his angels dwell and where God controls and sustains and governs the world. Jesus, the human, has entered that realm. That is what the ascension is about, that for the first time, a human body has entered that realm of heaven. This is a big deal. I mean, this means that a human now rules over all things. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that next week when we talk about how Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Um, St. John Chrysostom writes, Where the head goes, the body follows. And so because we are united to Christ, who is our head, uh, he's the head of a new humanity, we will follow him. His ascension is our future and reminds us of our destiny the, destiny, the destiny that God intended for all of us who are made in his image and likeness, but which Adam and Eve screwed up in the fall and that, and that we, um, with our sin, also mess up God's plan for us. But that, that plan, that original calling, we see in the ascension of Jesus Christ. This high calling of being a human is, is to be one with God and one with heaven. Now, right now, that's, that's something that we receive um, in part. So heaven is not something for just the future, but it's something that we receive in part. This heavenly life we, we experience through the Holy Spirit by faith. But at the end of all things, we will receive this new reality in all of its fullness by sight. So let's continue with the last question here. Question 72. What resulted from the ascension? Jesus ascended into heaven so that, through him, his Father might send us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, Christians together are united to Christ, the living head of his body, the church. Christ's ascension was necessary in order to send us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now that humanity is plugged in, you could think of it as humanity now is plugged into the spiritual heavenly realm, all who are in Christ, in relationship with Christ, because they trust in him, are given the gift of God himself. That is the Holy Spirit who now lives within us. The Holy Spirit, St. Augustine teaches us, is the love between the Father and the Son. So it's like the ascension is us being brought up 
into that eternal love so that we can now participate in that. We have now God's love in our heart, the Holy Spirit, and we are now a new unified people who love one another and love the Lord. We are called the church. So I think the important takeaway today is that uh, we need to remember who we are as Christians. If we are in Christ, we are called to bear our own crosses. And many crosses are heavy in this life. And in the suffering that this life brings and that our crosses bring, we can sometimes lose focus and, and um, become discouraged. Um, I'm a little bit discouraged today because of some news I've read. And um, it's important for us to think about the, the destiny that we have as his children, the, the destiny that we have as the church, that it won't always be this way, that the cross leads to the resurrection and the resurrection leads to the ascension. That our destiny is not sorrow. Our destiny is to be united with God, to be united with each other in complete and utter joy. Well, thank you for joining me. Leave a comment below, and I look forward to seeing you next week.